From that moment on, despite running one of racing's largest staples, only Bill's hands would touch Burgermeister. For the Houghton family, Hamiltonian Day was charged with emotion, not only for Bill, but also for Peter's younger brother, Tommy. Bill and Burgermeister waited in the wings as 23-year-old Tommy drove in the first elimination with his own Colt, final score. The real final score, Noble Hustle trying, coming at him, Devil Hanover on the extreme outside, racing up Nady Real, they race the lane, between them Noble Hustle, racing to the wire, Devil Hanover along the rail, final score, final score has won the first elimination. Tommy Houghton was the youngest driver to win a Hamiltonian heat, and after his success in that first elimination, it was time for Burgermeister and Bill Houghton to race. Along the rail, still leading Thor Viking, coming on Armbro Vanguard. Now Burgermeister, and on the inside, fighting back Thor Viking. Armbro Vanguard third. They race to the wire. On the outside, Burgermeister inside, Thor Viking. It's going to be Burgermeister. So the stage was set. The next race would determine the winner of the Hamiltonian. Tommy won the first heat with final score, then Burgermeister won the next elimination, and then um, final score made a break at the three-quarter pole for really no reason at all. I was there taking pictures at DuCoin, and uh, it's pretty tough to take pictures when your eyes are uh, teared over. I cried, and most other people did there, too. Lots of tears. Lots of tears. Happiness, tears, sadness, tears. It's very hard. Bill said I wasn't even driving the horse, I was just a passenger. the last Hamiltonian winner that Bill Houghton would drive. It was also the last time that the Hamiltonian would be raced in Decoin, Illinois, before moving to its current home at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. Two years later, strictly as a trainer, Bill watched proudly as Tommy furthered the family legacy when he drove Speed Bowl to victory. I've never, ever seen him so nervous in my life as I, I did that day. But anyway, it turned out. Super day. Stretch. But Jazz Cosmos is not through yet. Speedball attacks on the outside. One of these will be the winner of the Hamiltonian, and it's going to be Speedball. Speedball gets up in the final side, and Speedball gets up. Tommy was 25, the youngest driver ever to win Trotting's greatest race. It was the Houghton family's fifth Hamiltonian triumph, all coming in only a nine year span. But the path to Bill's first Hamiltonian had been a long 25-year trail that had repeatedly ended in heartache. That was until a colt named Christopher T came along and won the 1974 Classic. They come through the lane, Christopher T, and stock split on the outside with Anvil. But it's going to be Christopher T winning the Hamiltonian. Christopher T in second stock split. The jinx was broken. And after that, the Hamiltonian victories came in buckets for Bill Houghton. Two years later, Bill sipped glory again from the famed Silver Bowl, thanks to Colt Steve Lobel. A year later, he would again hold the trophy high. His third in four years, the Colt was green speed. It's green speed, green speed at winning the Hamiltonian. Honesty, integrity love, complete love of the sport, complete love of all the people around him. He was just an incredible person. And it's not because I was lucky enough to be married to him. Just ask anybody. 
Three years later, Greenspeed would produce a daughter. And that filly became a remarkable Cinderella story for Bill Houghton's friend and rival, Stanley Dancer. It was only fitting that Dancer and Houghton would be forever linked in Hamiltonian lore. The two were larger than life, and their success was seemingly always intertwined. So dominant were the pair during the 50s, 60s, and 70s that they were dubbed the Gold Dust Twins by the New York media. Dancer had driven three Hamiltonian victors and trained another by the time that 1983 rolled around. That year, he trained an outstanding colt named Dancer's Crown. Well, if there's ever going to be a horse that would have got Stanley and his fourth Hamiltonian as a driver, would have been Dancer's Crown back in 1983. As in 1982, as a two-year-old, he was undefeated, and he was a really special horse. He was, he was taken very patient. Stanley didn't race him a lot, but he had a real, real serious Hamiltonian look about him. And I know Stanley thought that it was the best, probably the best horse he ever had. Stanley Dancer's confidence soared as the pundits declared Dancer's Crown would be the one to beat. It was only 18 days till the Hamiltonian. Four o'clock in the morning, I got a call and he said, uh, you better get over here. Dancer's crown is really sick. He, Dr. Steele and Eggleston is working on him, but he's got the, they think, a twisted intestine and probably be have to be moved to Cornell. After emergency surgery, Dancer's crown seemed to be all right, but then there was a turn for the worse. And he said, oh. So anyway, I got him back in surgery and uh, and unfortunately, he died on the table. Stanley was really uh, heartbroken. He actually disappeared for a couple of weeks. Nobody knew where he was. I really sat out on the balcony. I couldn't get my thoughts together. And I said, you know, I really think I've done it long enough. I said, to lose one like that, I said, no. it just took all the fun out of it for me. Luckily, there was Norman Woolworth, one of the sport's most successful owners. I had talked to Stanley beforehand about that uh, racing Dwayne in the Hamiltonian. He said, no, he says, I don't really have, he wasn't too enthusiastic about it. I mean, he had a three-year-old trot and filly named Dwayne that was, yeah, she was all right. His two-year-olds wasn't any good. As a three-year-old, she had raced all right for me. Not great, but all right. So he wanted her to go to Buffalo, New York to race in the Sire Stake. She raced that night and she broke the track record. It was his idea to really race her in the Hamiltonian. It was not mine. And the race looked to be uh, wide open. And Norman and I have talked on the phone. I said, who's going to win the Hamiltonian? He said, I am, with Duena. Yeah, he's the one that really wanted to start in the Hamiltonian, which turned out great. The destiny of the day was, was just incredible. I don't think we've ever had anything that could quite match that uh, since. Certainly, I don't know if they had it before, but definitely not since. And on Hamiltonian Day, Duena provided Dancer with a script that even Hollywood couldn't dream up. At the 5 8 pole, Duena was on the lead, and John Campbell was inching up on the outside with Joie de V. Looked like he might be ready to go by, but Stanley rebuffed the challenge and said to John Campbell, not yet. The torch was not yet ready to be passed. Duena went on, and nothing was going to foul up the destiny of that day. Trot of eight, drops back slightly toward the inside. On the outside, here comes TV Yankee to challenge for the lead. They're in the stretch. And Duena, with Stanley Dancer in the bike, leads the way by two lengths. Trot of eight is now second at the inside. TV Yankee is racing in third. Then it's Speedy Claude fourth. Astro Hill is fifth on the outside. And Duena is all out to hold the lead. A host of us closing in. Here comes the other filly. Pinky's Hill on the outside. I think the best race I ever drove in my life was that race. And I think that uh, I was really just a lucky guy, or God was with me, or whatever. It was um, a storybook ending to uh, um, what started out as a rather tragic story. I have that great photo of Stanley with his arms up in the air uh, as he's crossing the wire. And it was uh, another feather in Stanley's cap. It was a happy moment and a sad moment, too, because I, don't know, I just keep thinking about the horse I had. Was supposed to win Hamilton, but didn't happen. It was Stanley Dancer's last Hamiltonian champion. But like Houghton, Dancer's first Hamiltonian hadn't come easily. He made his first start in the Hamiltonian in 1953. That year, he drove a horse named Newport Champ for his friend, Del Cameron. 
Though Newport Champ did not have any luck that day, 12 years later, Dancer returned the favor to Cameron. The heavy favorite in the 1965 Hamiltonian was Noble Victory, trained and driven by Dancer with just one loss in 18 starts. Dancer asked Cameron to handle his other entrant, Egyptian Candor, zoned by Stanley's wife, Rachel. Noble Victory had trouble finding footing that day on the rain-soaked track. Dancer's entrant, Egyptian Candor, would prevail in a final that was contested in near darkness. Although it took him 12 years of trying, Stanley Dancer could at last lay at least partial claim to a Hamiltonian champion. It would be three more years before he would drive a Hamiltonian winner. That horse was one of Dancer's all-time greats, Neville Pride. You know, most of Neville Pride's races, including the Hamiltonian, were kind of boring because he was so much the best that he just, uh, Stanley would shoot him to the front with that gate speed, back the pace down a little bit, and then sprint home. And I mean, he was so dominant that nobody dared um, uh, challenge him. And he, he was so intimidating that the races were boring. So dominant was Neville Pride that he was named Horse of the Year in all three years that he raced. He was also only one of six horses to win Trotting's Triple Crown. Dancer would have another Triple Crown and Hamiltonian champion in 1972. That horse's name was Super Bowl. Like Neville Pride, Super Bowl utterly dominated in the Hamiltonian with a world record performance. Into the stretch, Super Bowl, running strongly, leads the way by two. Racing in second, Delmonica, Hanover, Fox is third, and Super Bowl is drawing away. In the final race of the mile, Super Bowl, drawing away Then in 1975, the 50th year of the Hamiltonian, Dancer won again when he drove the favorite, a colt by the name of Bonefish, to victory. So powerful is Dancer's connection to the Hamiltonian that even to this day, at the age of 72, he's still trying to train another champion. I wish that I could drive another race. And I'll probably die thinking that same thing, that, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I still remain that I always give it my best and I was always honest. To me, that meant a lot. And while Duena's 1983 victory was the most dramatic Hamiltonian triumph of Dancer's illustrious career, that race was important for another reason. It was the first Hamiltonian appearance by a young, immensely talented driver by the name of John Campbell. In 1983, Campbell finished second to Dancer and Duena with a horse named Joie de Ville. Twelve years later, the two men were poised to win the race together. The talented colt that Dancer trained and John Campbell had committed to drive. The horse's name was Donnerail, and he was a champion two-year-old. But Donnerail's story took an unkindly twist for Dancer and a strange one for John Campbell. Less than two weeks before the Hamiltonian, Donnerail was retired. The colt had been unable to recapture his two-year-old magic. I was pulling into the barn one morning, and my wife was already at the barn and she comes flying out of the barn with a newspaper in her hand. And she said, they retired Donnerail, you gotta call John. I said, well, it's 6.30 in the morning, he's probably not up yet. She said, I don't care, you gotta call him, we gotta get him to drive Tagliabue. The drive with Tagliabue would give John Campbell his 13th consecutive Hamiltonian appearance. I was more than happy to get the drive on, on Tagliabue because I thought at that point I, I didn't have anything going into the race. And uh, so I was just tickled to, to get the chance to drive a horse in the Hamiltonian. But the driver knew he had his work cut out for him. TRK Susie was the overwhelming favorite for the Allen family. But in her elimination, she was going to lead, made a break, recovered, finished sixth, and didn't make the final. At that point, the floodgates had opened for everybody else, and Tagliabue was poised to seize the opportunity. Before we went out for the final, we'd drawn the rail in the final. And uh, Jim has a tendency to be a little nervous in situations like that. And he was pacing around there. And uh, I just looked over at him and said, this is why we're in it. And uh, just kind of summed up the whole feeling that, uh, you know, win, lose, or draw. I mean, we, you want that pressure. You want to be in that position to have the favorite in the Hamiltonian. Jim Campbell watched the race with owner Jules Siegel. 
But the head of the stretch, I was watching John, and he had the whip sitting on his shoulder. And I knew he had lots of trot. And my only concern was just stay trotting, big boy. And uh, I, I, knew, I knew nobody was going to catch him. It was just a matter of, you know, no mistakes. And uh, halfway down the lane, I was getting, getting very excited. And as they were getting, as Tagaboo was getting closer to the wire, I put my arm around Mr. Siegel. And I, I, with the excitement, I practically choked him from being so excited. And we were, both of us, we were just in awe. I'll never forget as long as I live walking up to John. That embrace, I don't think we could ever duplicate that again. It was so special to, to drive for Jimmy in the Hamiltonian, but to win it, um, it was just uh, an incredible feeling. My, my mom and dad were there, my daughters, Paula, Lisa, Michelle, Brittany. It, it was just so special. Some would later refer to that race as the Campbelltonian. As kids growing up on a farm in Ontario, John and Jim used to play out their ultimate harness racing fantasies. John spent countless hours in a broken sulky that he'd tied together with binder twine and lashed to a pump. He often wore the set of family colors that his mother made for him when he was six, a set that was later handed down to Jim. Still, the Campbell boys never actually believed that one day they would hoist harness racing's greatest prize, even though both their father, Jack, and their grandfather, Dunk, were renowned Canadian horsemen. In 1995, Hamiltonian, when a tag label had strong emotional ties with John Campbell, and actually his brother, Jim, trained the horse. But when you're talking about the greatest horse John ever drove in Hamiltonian, no doubt at all, that was a 1987 winner, that was Mac LaBelle. Mac at his best was just awesome, absolutely awesome. The bond between man and horse was forged in the late 1980s. Never had Campbell driven a trotter with such blinding speed. As a two-year-old, Mac LaBelle set a world record that would stand for 12 years. As a three-year-old, he was poised for Hamiltonian greatness. And by the time the Hamiltonian arrived in August of 1987, Mac LaBelle had solidified his position as the race favorite. Mac Lobel's performance would prove to be one of the most dominating displays that the Hamiltonian had ever seen. At the top of the lane, it's Mac Lobel, the leader in the Hamiltonian by three lengths. And Napolitano is trying to catch him as they come into the final eight. And the others are far back. It's Mac Lobel, and he's pouring it on. Mac Lobel in front now by four or five. Napolitano is never going to catch him. The others are far back. Here is a brilliant trotter. Mac Lobel has won the Hamiltonian. The magic that John brought to Mac Lobel was to actually outthinking Mac. And when Mac tried to do something, John was already two steps ahead of him. He really outsmarted Mac Lobel. And if you outsmarted Mac, nobody could outtrot him, and, and they were almost unbeatable. Winning it with Mac and winning my first one made it uh, very special. A year later, Campbell again embraced the Hamiltonian trophy when Armbro Goal won. 1990, Campbell won with Harmonious, the driver's third Hamiltonian triumph in only four years. In 1998, he would again write his name on the Silver Bowl. And once more, it would be Campbell and Chuck Sylvester who flexed their biceps in trotting's greatest spectacle, 11 years after Mac Lobel ruled the track for the pair. The Colts' name was Muscles Yankee. The victory came with relative ease, and when it was over, John Campbell had driven his fifth winner in the Classic, a Hamiltonian record. There's no doubt at all that John Campbell's the number one driver in all of harness racing, all of harness racing history. He's almost $180 million lifetime, $17 million wins, and a 28-year career. John has done everything and more that a driver could possibly do. Ben White, Bill Houghton, and Stanley Dancer had each driven four Hamiltonian champions. Campbell was typically modest after breaking the record. He said his accomplishment paled in comparison to the others because they'd also trained all their own horses. 
All modesty aside, John Campbell's hand in crafting the modern-day Hamiltonian legend is equal to that of what Bill Houghton and Stanley Dancer forged in the race's Middle Ages and what Ben White achieved in its early days. The Hamiltonian's prestige, its riches, and its drama make it the ultimate measurement of harness racing greatness. Even after 75 years, relatively few have been able to say that once, just once, their horse was the best in the world. So powerful is the allure of that silver bowl that each time the Hamiltonian is contested, a rich cast of characters, both human and equine, assemble all with the same intent. The sure thing, the long shot, the dark horse, they've all had their moment upon the Hamiltonian stage. As was often the case, the Hamiltonian did not unfold as many expected in 1989. The two early favorites that year were the Super Philly Peace Corps, who carried a 17-race win streak into the Hamiltonian, and Valley Victory, a colt who was undefeated in all seven of his starts leading into the Trotting Classic. But in the weeks before the Hamiltonian, Valley Victory came down with a virus and was not entered in the race. That left Peace Corps as the overwhelming favorite, but a five-week layoff caught up to Peace Corps. In the first elimination, she faded to fifth, and a long-shot colt named Probe trotted to victory. Just slightly behind him was another unheralded colt named Park Avenue Joe. It's Probe in front, Park Avenue Joe toward the inside, those two in a photo finish, and Probe is hanging on. Later that day, everyone would know both their names. In the second heat, Park Avenue Joe and his driver Ron Waples turned the tables on Probe and his reinsman Bill Fay. And Probe was not a factor. And it is Park Avenue Joe to win it in a game performance from Peace Corps. At that time, a Hamiltonian champion had to win twice on the same day. Park Avenue Joe's win forced a two-horse race-off with Probe. The two Colts loafed through most of the mile, Park Avenue Joe in the lead and Probe sitting a comfortable distance behind. As they turned for home, Waples and Fay unleashed their trotters, beginning a frantic sprint toward the wire. This was an impossible result. To have two horses racing for the third time on the same day, two horses in a match race, Probe attacks on the outside, and neither of these brave trotters giving way. They are full tilt down the stretch, an eighth of a mile out. Park Avenue Joe digging in gamely. Probe pokes ahead in front. Probe on the outside. Park Avenue Joe comes roaring back. A relentless crowd to the wire. Park Avenue Joe. Probe, here's the finish. Too close to call. If you told someone that that actually happened, that there was a dead heat in a match race, they'd tell you, that's unbelievable. I don't believe you. Well, believe it. Now, the reaction was bizarre. Wow, this is unbelievable. I've seen something that's just incredible. The next reaction was, do they have to race again? Will they have to go a fourth time? Who won the Hamilton? Well, after what seemed like an eternity, the judges determined that Park Avenue Joe and Probe would become the first and still the only horses to equally share a Hamiltonian. All I know is that was the most unbelievable race I ever called with the most unlikely result I could ever imagine and as exciting and a sporting event as there ever was. In 1996, coming off the final turn, a beautiful black filly named Continental Victory was just a nose ahead of the colt Lindy Lane. A thick black tail was raised just below the face of her driver Mike LaChance. One step behind, Lindy Lane was locked in the same perfect stride as Continental Victory. Backdrop was a sea of fans pressed against the rail. She was iron tough and lightning fast. Her trainer epitomized the modern era of the Hamiltonian, the New York City native Ron Gurfein. In her elimination, Continental Victory reeled off a record mile of just over one minute and 52 seconds. And that time would stand as a Hamiltonian record until three years later when the Gerfein and Lachance team won again with self-possessed and trotted the fastest race mile in history. Continental victory was just as impressive in the final, battling fiercely with Lindy Lane throughout the mile and eventually holding off the colt by a half length. 
That win made Continental victory the 13th in most recent Philly to win the Hamiltonian. At the Meadowlands from the beginning, Mal Burroughs, a man who started a construction empire with a single dump truck, was an integral part of building the Meadowlands' famed racing oval. A multi-millionaire, Burroughs' passion for racing horses went way beyond that of most horse owners. He so hungered to drive in the big time that he passed up hiring professional drivers to sit behind his own horses while maintaining his amateur status. In 1994, a very special colt named Malabar Man was romping at Burroughs, New Jersey farm. But then on New Year's Eve of 1995, Burroughs suffered a massive heart attack that nearly ended his life. The doctors gave him a choice. They said, you know, we can give you medication and you'll be able to live a life, uh, but you won't be able to drive horses. You know, to do that, we'll have to do the heart surgery. And Mal said, start cutting. Miraculously, 10 months later, Burroughs returned to the track and had his sights firmly set on the 1997 Hamiltonian. Despite entering the trotting classic as the favorite, Burroughs' quest was not without its challenges. Only one amateur driver had ever won the Hamiltonian, Harrison Hoyt, when he drove Demon Hanover to victory in 1948. But the 56-year-old Burroughs gave Malabar Man a perfect steer on Hamiltonian Day finding a tiny opening up the rail and threading the colt through a gap that he would later describe like the parting of the Red Sea. With his arm pointed skyward, Burroughs shouted to the heavens. Within 20 years after helping to build the world's most famous harness racing complex, Mal Burroughs had written surely the Meadowlands' most memorable chapter. The story epitomizes what makes the Hamiltonian more than just another horse race. No matter what happens to me or what happens to the horse, the Hamiltonian will live on. It's still the greatest race there is, is the Hamiltonian. You can take the records away, horses will go faster, horses will win more money, but there's only one Hamiltonian winner each year, and and that's the culmination of a dream. I don't think that anything's more exciting than, than to own a trotter and win the Hamiltonian. Anytime you get in the Hamiltonian, I like to say it's special, but when you get to win that race, it's an indescribable feeling for me. And uh, that, that'll never change, even if I'm fortunate enough to win it again. To learn more about harness racing and the Hamiltonian, log on to hambo75.com and visit the Harness Racing Museum and Hall of Fame in Goshen, New York. It's Mac Lobel, and he's pouring it on! It's Nyad Frost by four, and he's going away! The Harness Racing Museum and Hall of Fame, a place where heroes come to life, preserving harness racing's treasured past while promoting its exciting future. And get ready to harness your excitement with the thrill of Harness Racing's 3D Simulator, the Harness Racing Museum and Hall of Fame. Now open, bigger, better, bolder than ever.